Oh, yeah, man. It's a frequency war, man. It's a frequency war, man. Let's hear it from a plain truth, peace, and power. The question people are now asking is, was there a more sinister reason for the change? Since a number of researchers have stated that people feel differently under the long-term influence of music and broadcasts at 440 hertz than they actually do at the natural organic broadcast of 432 hertz. So is there evidence of a difference? Well, number four. First, we have to start with the difference itself. And there is one. Take a look at these different examples of how music played at 432 hertz forms different particle patterning than it does when played at 440 hertz. Take a look. Separation, duality, thought. Unity, geometric, platonic solids. Now this is a widely known phenomenon in regards to sound and how it affects particles. But at least here we can see a difference between the two frequencies. As noted, 432 hertz appears less broken, more symmetrical, while the frequency at 440 hertz seems more broken and more distorted. The effects this would have on the human being over a long period of time is of course unknown. But if we use logic and scientific principle, we can note that because there is a measurable change and a visual one, that there must be indeed a change to human. So they are literally splitting us apart. Humans. After all, humans are physical creatures whose physiology affects their overall psychological well-being. The only question is, is how much does this affect a human? Does it come down to a difference in small thoughts leading a response to information in a subtle, almost immeasurable way? Or is it larger and maybe even a physiological effect on cells or the human nervous system? Number three. Now, of course, it's hard to find evidence of any long-term studies, given the nature of this on human beings. But there is a couple of examples, at least in regards to plants, as well as a whole host of anecdotal evidence, such as plant growers noting that when classical music is actually played to, let's say, grape growers, that their grapes actually grow larger in essence they have better yields. This goes back to the idea that classical music is better for crops, and of course classical music is mainly tuned to the 432 frequency, at mm. least if it's pre-industrial standard. Now, to be fair, there's not much studies in relation to the 440 band versus the 432 band or frequency in regards to the effect on plants. There's only a relationship between classical music and plant growth. However, there was a study that took place in the National Institute of Biotechnology in South Korea, which monitored the effect of frequencies on plants and in none less than DNA. And it showed that there was a relationship between 125 hertz and 250 hertz, which showed, in essence, the pretty amazing fact that these frequencies actually directly affected plant growth. The question is, if these frequencies affected plant growth in a significant way, the actual DNA of the plants and their ability in order to absorb sunlight, then what does the 440 frequency and the differential between that and the 432 frequency? That is, if frequencies actually affect plant growth, then what are the effects of other frequencies like 440 and 432 in relation to human beings? Hmm. Well, that is unknown, but there is here clear evidence of an effect on frequencies on living plants, at least. So here, at least, we have clear evidence that actual frequencies affect the DNA <coughs> of living structures. And this so check it. If they affect plant growth, then you know it affects the Naga growth and everybody else's growth. You know what I mean? How is it affecting your maturity? You know what I mean? Your ability to reason. Your ability to filter out the bullshit, right? In this case, plants and their growth. 
Number two, of course it does not have to be classical. Any music can be taken and converted to play at 432Hz. You just have to convert it yourself since all modern music, post-1955 at least, and earlier, is actually subscribes to the industrial standard of using 440Hz. Click the link below if you want to know how to convert your music. We did a couple of videos on this. We also convert your music, join our drop VIP five dollars fifty songs a month we convert fifty songs a month so tune in and check in 432thedrop.com to go so this is not a difference between classical music or modern music this is a difference between the fundamental tuning of the instruments and how it's recorded and projected but if you want to listen to the music and see if you can actually pick up anything yourself, although that would be hard to do, since they both sound so similar, have a listen to both frequencies played with the same music and see if you can pick up the difference yourself. Have a listen. Two. One of the most interesting things to consider is if there is a frequency effect within sand particles, what does that have to do with water? Because of course the human body is made up of 70% or more of in fact water. So would this effect have an actual change within the physiology itself if the frequency has such a different change within water itself? Well, here is one experiment that someone performed. Take a look. But if there is a measurable difference in plant growth, at least if we're using logic, and there's a difference within visual evidence in regards to particles <coughs> and frequency, as you can see here, then is there a difference? Well, most likely there is a difference, at least at some level, even if it's a small minute difference within the psychology or the human system itself, there no doubt would be some influencing difference. Because if science tells us anything, it tells us one thing, and that's energy affects other energy. Mm -hmm. Within a system like this, where you're dealing with frequencies, you're talking about the exchange of energy. But then again, everything in our natural world affects us, at least in some way. From the food you eat, from the air you breathe, to the water you drink, everything has some effect on you. The question, of course, is how large is the effect? But just because you cannot prove it on a mass scale does not mean you cannot prove it on a minute scale. So perhaps you should just go out and listen to some music at these frequencies and see if your mood improves. Have a look. You can play it yourself and of course decide for yourself. As goes for everything in the video, go out and do your own research and of course come to your own conclusions. In the meantime though, let me know what you think in the comments section. Maybe have a listen to the music and tell me your effects as well as others. And give the video a thumbs up if you did like it. That would of course help me out a lot. And in the meantime, this is Ed from The Outer Dark and take care and I'll see you guys later. Very interesting, right? Very interesting. And again, you know, when we first, uh, you know, launched this off, you know, it, at first it was all about, you know, putting our hip hop you know, flow or, or rap or R and B flow, putting that into four three two, you know. But then it became <laughs> much more of a soulful process, man. Then it became, you know what I'm saying, just uh you know, just you know, something that we was hearing just to 
a sound, a flow that we all started hearing at the same time, and we cut through the indigenous truth together. We cut through the orientation, you know, the uh, the the flat plane orientation of where we're at. You know, what I'm saying we cut through the Torah. You know, what I mean, cutting through the Most High's, you know, laws and commandments, and all that while you know combining this with the 432 you know what i'm saying when you go listen in the ether you enjoy you know great books and all that but we always got that 432 flowing and we knew that that became the excalibur sword of what we were swinging in drop nation we knew that you know we keep it torah you know we keep it to not we keep grounded as the seeds of a walk clearly you know what i mean we we have our indigenous truth you know what i'm saying we know that we're from here we know, we know we ain't spinning on no damn ball. So we're oriented. We're not spinning, you know, psychologically. We're able to have a still moment. And then we got the 432 flowing in. That collectively made a lot of sense, man. It makes, you know, uh, a big difference in how we learn and how we process. So when we talk frequency, we got to get back to the beginning of this, man. We got to, you know... We hear the 432, the 440 thing. We see the change that happened. Um, we're going to get over more detail about the standard standardization of uh, 440. But I want to start right here and, uh, you know, get it like it's the first time, but really, you know, cover some new connections as we've had our investigation. So pull the links up below. Let's get it. So the Homedale Horn Antenna. I mean, this is... You know, kind of the beginning of this wave experimentation um, before they start switching your frequencies. You know what I'm saying? Um, you know, there's a reason why they're pumping out their own frequencies. You know, they're, they're, they're pumping out their own waves in order to get rid of what they call static. But see, the hijack is always uh, thinking inside out. They're always upside down. What they call static is Hawa. What they call static is, is, is natural, natural frequency. But what they need to make their equipment work is something synthetic. They got to pump, they got to boost their signal to something synthetic to avoid the natural, the nature frequencies. You know what I'm saying? The resonance, the resonance, man. So... Let's get it. The horn antenna, the Homedale horn antenna, is a large microwave horn antenna that was used as a satellite communication antenna and radio telescope during the 1960s at Bell Telephone Laboratories in Homedale Township, New Jersey, United States. It was designated a natural historic landmark in 1988 because of its association with the research of two radio astronomers Arnold Penzias, Penzias and Robert Wilson. In 1965, while using this antenna, Penzias and Wilson discovered the cosmic microwave background radiation, CMBR, that permeates the universe. Discovered the cosmic microwave background radiation that they say permeates the universe. So this is a flow, this is a frequency that they're discovering for themselves that has already existed. It's a sound. They're calling it background noise. <laughs> well, who's in the background? Oh, just the universal static, the universal background microwave cosmic radiation CMBR, all this fancy stuff. You're just talking about the flow, the sound, the same sound that we're hearing. So when we say we're hearing a sound, we are really hearing a sound, a flow that goes through us. It resonates, you know, it keeps it, it keeps everything fluid. It's the water, it's the mem. Let's go, man. So they're calling it a microwave background radiation permeating the universe. This was one of the most important discoveries in physical cosmology since 
Edwin Hubble. So this was a big deal. The Hubble telescope is a super big deal. They're going to talk about the Big Bang Theory, all the hijacked sciences. Always on time, man. The hijack is always, always on time. Right? So we know when they talk physical cosmologies, they're talking serious science. They're talking breakthrough. So this cosmic microwave background radiation was a breakthrough. A breakthrough. Let's go down a little bit. The Horn Antenna at Bell Telephone Laboratories in Homedale, New Jersey was constructed in 1959 to support Project Echo. That's another thing to look up. The National Aeronautics and Space Administration's Passive Communication Satellites. Woo! Which use large earth orbiting aluminized plastic bottles and re as reflectors to bounce radio signals from one point on the earth to another. The antenna is 50 feet in length with a radiating aperture of 20 by 26 by 6 meters and is constructed of aluminum. The antenna's elevation wheel, which surrounds the midsection of the horn, is 30 feet in diameter and supports the weight of the structure by means of rollers mounted on the base frame. All right. Get all technical on this. Get all technical. So, you know, this is just an intro to the horn, but let's get a little deeper. Let's get a little realer. All right. This site is from pbs.org. Let's go. So, Bell Laboratories. We're going to tie all this into 432, 440, the frequency war. Love to Yosef Derrida kicking that silent weapons, quiet wars, the continuation of the flow, because we know these are silent weapons, quiet wars. But why? Why are they calling it static? Why do they need the static to disappear so that they can have their communications? You're telling me there's a natural communication. They're going to be like... Oh, yeah, you know, it's just a, you know, maybe some extraterrestrial communication. Man, you're talking about the flow. See, we hear the sound, but some people don't hear the sound. They need to create their own sound, right? Their own synthetic sound, their own synthetic flow. Let's read about it. The Homedale Satellite Antenna. So, Penzias and Wilson discovered cosmic microwave radiation in 1965 this was huge right they said it's coming from everywhere boss the sound is coming from everywhere boss bell labs built a giant antenna in homedale new jersey 1960 it was part of a very early satellite transmission system called echo by collecting and amplifying weak radio signals bounced off large metallic balloons high in the atmosphere it could send signals across long distances. Within a few years, the Telstar satellite was launched. It had built in transponders and made the echo system obsolete. Meanwhile, two employees. Now you're getting the background scoop of where this wave, this wave, the synthetic wave, the matrix. I mean, here's what we're really putting together. Just so you know why it's part. Why it's a sincere part of our investigation. I mean, in all probability, we could be researching the we could be researching the infrastructure of the matrix, man. You're just talking energy, frequency, vibration, and we're we're studying when they discovered that it was even necessary to boost radio signals to create a grid right there's a grid when they start boosting these signals and creating you know all the stuff they're saying over studying the ionosphere and all this they're creating a grid of energy right so it has everything to do with what we call matrix uh some type of synthetic reality you know different things like that it goes deeper man so Again, meanwhile, these two employees of Bell Laboratories, Ar Arno Penzias, German-born radio astronomer, joined Bell Laboratories in 1958. He had done his Ph.D. on using masters microwave amplification by stimulating emission of radio or radiation 
to amplify and measure radio signals from the spaces between galaxies. He knew that Homedale antenna would make also make a great radio telescope and was dying to use it to continue his observation, but he pursued other research while the antenna was booked for commercial use. Another radio astronomer came to Bell Labs in 1962 with the same idea, Robert Wilson, and he also used masters to amplify weak signals in mapping radio signals from the Milky Way. The launch of Telstar in 1962 gave both researchers what they wanted. The Homedale antenna was freed up for, per for pure research. When they began to use it as a telescope, they found there was a background noise, like static in a radio. They're saying that there's a background noise. They're calling you static, right? You're the savage, right? You got to juxtapose. You got to compare these things, man. When we study the dragons, we see how they are also... You know, called devils and this and this and this, you know, by the hijack written in as this and this. But the real devil is the dog. The real devil is the fox, is the coyote, the dog headed, the man's best friend, dog headed, right? So we know what the static is. We know what the static is from our perspective. But from their perspective, they're discovering a noise in the background. A noise that they don't know where it's coming from, boss. They don't understand this noise, man. They say this annoyance. Because they want to take over the cosmos. They want, you know, to be the only thing smoking. The only signal smoking, right? But there's already a signal. There's already a signal without their, you know, horn, horn radio satellites. You know what I'm saying? There's a natural vibration they call it today a, a Schumann right the earth Schumann residence but even that is you know what I'm saying it's based in reality yeah but they you know play off with the numbers a certain type of way still to throw us off of what the Schumann is but we know that there's a flow there's a signal there's a wave that's already in existence they're calling this natural wave annoyance they say this annoyance was a uniform signal in the microwave range seeming to come from all directions. How many directions? All directions. So this ain't no play play, boss. 1965 is when they just stumbling on this drop. That there's a sound, there's a frequency coming from all directions. Everyone assumed it came from the telescope itself which was not unusual. It hadn't interfered with the echo system, but Penzias and Wilson had to get rid of it to make the observations they planned. They checked everything to rule out the source of the excess radiation, the sound, the voice. They pointed the antenna right at New York City. It wasn't urban interference. So it wasn't people. It wasn't the cars and the, and the planes. It wasn't radiation from our galaxy or extraterrestrial radio sources. It wasn't even the pigeons living in the big horn-shaped antenna. Penzias and Wilson kicked them out and swept out all the droppings. The source remained the same throughout the four seasons. So it couldn't have been the solar system or even from a 1962 above-ground nuclear test because in the year that that fallout would have shown a decrease. They had to conclude it was not the machine and it was not random noise causing the radiation. Now that's pretty much as far as they're going to go. They're not going to be able to cut through it past the point that they have no idea what's causing this noise to hit them from all directions. But they're just calling it background noise. They're calling it static. They're saying this is annoying. But it's hitting us from all directions. So they had to conclude that, man, this was not random noise, man. But we don't know what it is.
Gonzalez and Wilson began looking for theoretical explanations around the same time Robert Dick at nearby Princeton University had been pursuing theories about the Big Bang. He had elaborated on an existing theory to suggest that if there had been a Big Bang, the residue... <laughs> Come on, man. Come on, man. Come on, man. So here's this Big Bang thing. All right, man. And they're saying that this explosion of the Big Bang is... <laughs> is the reason for this noise. <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> These hijacks, man. I tell you, man, the, the hijack train is never late, man. All right, so the residue of the explosion should by now take the form of a low-level background radiation throughout the universe. Dick was looking for, uh, for evidence of this theory when Penzias and Wilson got in touch with his lab. He shared his theoretical work with them even as he uh, resi resonantly or resignedly, resignedly said to his fellow researchers, we've been scooped. Uh, ironically, Robert Wilson had been trained in steady state theory, which suggested the universe was without beginning or end, unlike Big Bang Theory, and he felt uncomfortable with the Big Bang explanation on their radio noise. He should feel uncomfortable. It's utter BS. Let, let go. So when he and Penzias joined, jointly published their work, research with Dick, the Bell Lab researchers struck to just the facts, simply reporting their recorded observations. It is ironic, too, that many researchers, both theoretical and experiment, experimental, had stumbled on this phenomenon before, but either discounted it or never put it all together. Well, have they put it all together? This was partly because, as Steven Weinberg wrote in the 1950s, the study of the universe was widely regarded as not the sort of thing to which a respectable scientist would devote his time since Benzias, Wilson, and Dick's work, all that has changed the measurement of cosmic background radiation, as the Homedale Telescope's noise is now called. Cosmic, they just coining this thing right the cosmic background radiation combined with edwin hubble's much earlier finding that the galaxies galaxies are rushing away all this is crap with their telescopes so the whole theory is crap big bang evolution their telescopes isolated globular bodies you know what i'm saying love the giannini man so he's saying to make a strong case for the big bang all right man so by the 1970s, astronomers called it the standard model. Arnold Penzias and Robert Wilson received the Nobel Prize in Physics. This is not play play, man. So their discovery of the natural vibration of Hawa, the natural vibration of the secure breath, the, the breathing, the frequency, the natural vibration, they went a Nobel Prize in Physics in 1978. But you don't know about it, right? You don't know why they've boosted up their signals, man. Pull this link up, man. The creation of sound, man. We, we're just trying to get to the, to the real bottom of this thing, man. To the bottom line. To the foundation of what this matrix, what this reality, what this frequency war is. I mean... Clearly, they're tearing us apart. Everything in our world is a wave form. Right? So we say, surf the wave, then choosing up, then you got to choose your wave form. There's wave forms for negativity and chaos and bullshit. And there's wave forms, man, for, you know what I'm saying, order. You know what I mean? A high love, right? So. Everything in our world is a waveform, sometimes called pattern or a sine wave structure. Or could even be seen as sound. Huh? So what's this sound? Everything could be seen as sound. The most I says, I give my word with my word, my word, with my word. Let there be light, word, sound, all things, your bodies, planets, planes. Let's go. 
absolutely everything as waveforms. If you choose this particular way of looking at reality and superimpose that view over the reality of the harmonics of the music and aspect of sound, we can begin to talk about different dimensions. Okay, why is it important to get off the 440 hijack? Why are we working hard behind the scenes to create an atmosphere and a cozy place for you to do so? Let's go. The dimensional levels are nothing but di differing base rate wavelengths. The only difference between this dimension and other and any other is the length of its basic waveform. So you're in two different dimensions when you're surfing different waves, man. It's just like a television or radio set. When you turn the dial, you pick up a different wavelength. That's dimensions. Let's go. Man, let's go, man. Empty your cup. Then you get a different image on your TV screen or a different station on your radio. It's exactly the same for dimensional level. So we're tuned to a certain frequency what they call the Schumann Residence, uh, 7.83, you know, hertz or 7.23 centimeter wavelength. We're going to get into this centimeter, the 7.23, and what they had to do with what Bell Laboratories that we just read about did to get the static out, right? Because they're still calling this nothing but static, random noise, right? What they say, this annoyance, like static in a radio. All right, but when you switch the, switch the frequency, switch the wavelength, you get a different radio station or TV station. Different images start to appear. What are they doing, sir? So the, the dimensional levels are nothing but differing base rate wavelengths. The only difference between this dimension and the other is the length of its basic waveform. It's just like a television or radio set. Let's go. When you turn the dial, you pick up a different wavelength. Then you get a different image on your TV screen or a different station on your radio. It's exactly the same for dimensional levels. This universe, and by that I mean all the stars and atoms going infinitely out and infinitely in forever has a base wavelength of 7.23 centimeters. Now you go get the drop and you know what I'm saying, see how they come up with this 7.23. But let's just play with the mathematics and see what they're doing when they switch our frequency. This universe has a base wavelength of 7.23 centimeters. You can pick any spot on this room and go infinitely in, all right, or infinitely out forever within this particular universe. I mean, overstand. So we're talking 7.23, just you know, gematria wise, you know, you got seven, two, that's nine, the law of nines, that cancels out, you just have a three. So, remember what Tesla said, if you want to know the secrets to the universe, you got to overstand the numbers, three, six, and nine. Let's keep going. In a spiritual sense, this 7.23 wavelength is um. All right, because we're going to get on the arms. We're just talking energy, frequency, vibration. So you hear the Tibet meditation. Like, um, that is a very specific wave we're talking about. 7.23 centimeter wavelength we're talking about. So what does that mean? What does that add up to? Let's go. The Hindu sound of the universe, or the Hindu, Hindu, or indigenous. Every object in this universe produces a sound according to its construction. Each object makes a unique sound. If you average the sounds of all the objects in the universe, 
can start to mention, you would get this 7.23 centimeter wavelength, and it would be the true sound of ohm for this dimension. So this wavelength is also the exact average distance between our eyes from the center of one pupil to the other. That is, if you take 100 people and average them, it's also the exact average distance from the tip of our chins to the tip of our noses, the distance across our palms and the distance between our chakras. To give a few more examples, this 7.23 length is located throughout our bodies in various ways because we are emerged within this particular universe. So this is the signature and it is embedded within us. This is deep, especially for the Naga. It was Bell Laboratories. That's what we were just reading about this Homedale horn antenna. Right? Penzias and Wilson. Let's go. We were just reading about the static. We were just talking about Penzias and Wilson. They get this Nobel Prize. They call it Cosmic Microwave Radiation in 1965. We're just talking Bell Laboratories, right? Bell Laboratories discovered this wavelength. <laughs> so they stumbled on the static, they're calling it. Not some spiritual person sitting in a cave somewhere. Hmm. Did Bell Laboratories invent? You see how they, you see how the hijack writes, man? Bell, it was Bell Laboratories that discovered this wavelength, not some spiritual person sitting in a, in a cave somewhere. That spiritual person sitting in a cave was connected to the arm um, before, before 1965. I mean, I would just have to surf the wave and, and uh, go ahead and uh, chalk that up. I don't think Bell Laboratories invented the arm, um, right? <laughs> did they win a Nobel? Did they win a Nobel Prize for inventing the arm? Um? Oh, because they stumbled on something that they were annoyed by? That they considered it just noise and static? That's why these Tibetan monks and priests and and you know this goes back to you know go back to Mu, you know what I'm saying? This goes back a long way, this arm um, frequency. I mean, did the Bell Laboratories build the, build the uh, elaborate pyramids or elaborate frequency machines or anything else, man? So, check it, man. They just tripping, man. All right. Bell Laboratories discovered this wavelength. They stumbled on it way late, way later than the spiritual person in the cave. Hijack 101. Let's go, man. When they first put up the microwave system. That went around the United States and pulled the on switch. They found static in their system. So I don't think the person in the cave would call it static. Because they're meditating too. You see Bell Labs just happened to pick the system's sending frequency one slightly longer than 7 centimeters. Why they chose that wavelength I don't know. They tried to find the static. They tried to find the static, right? Looked through their equipment and tried everything they could. First, they thought it was coming from inside the earth. Eventually, they looked into the heavens and found it. They looked into the heavens. Wow. And found it and said, oh, no, boss. It's coming from everywhere. It's coming. In order to get rid of the static, they did something that we as a nation and a plane are still suffering from. So they looked inside and said, oh no, it's coming from everywhere. In order to get rid of the static, they did something that we as a nation are still suffering from. They upped the power 50 thousand times over what they would normally need which created a what a very powerful field K 
Can anyone say Matrix? Can anyone say Christ Conscious Grid? <laughs> Amen. So the field that existed, you know what I'm saying, prior to this experiment, and they're only giving you a slither of it, you know, it's way more under the table black ops going on. But they're only giving us a slither into uh, this particular historic, powerful field that was set off in 1965 by Bell Laboratories, Pac Bell, AT&T, all that, same thing. So a very powerful field was created so that the 7.2 centimeter wavelength coming from everywhere would not interfere. So they didn't want no interference in what they were about to do by creating this very powerful field and upping the power 50,000 times to create. They had to up their power 50,000 times over what would normally be needed so that nothing would interfere with the frequency that they wanted to put on us. For reasons such as the above, I believe that the 7.23 centimeters is the wavelength of our universe or our creator in this dimension, this third dimension, one, two, three. As you go up into dimensional levels, the wavelength gets shorter and shorter with higher and higher energy. As you go down in dimensional levels, the wavelengths get, get longer and longer with longer and with lower and lower energy, more and more dense. Just as with the piano, there's a space between the notes so that when you hit one note, there's a very definite place where the next note is in this waveform universe we exist in there is a very definite place where the next dimension level exists it's a specific wavelength relative to this one is this how you get to shambhala is this how you get to these these magical realms is, is, is this how we tune up musicians music theorists physicists discovered long ago that there are places between the notes called overtones between each step of chromatic scale, there are 12 major overtones. A group of California has, has discovered 200 minor overtones between each note. So they're saying each of these overtones, minor or major, is a whole nother dimension. If we show each note in a chromatic scale as a circle, we have 13 circles. 13 is a special number. Each circle represents a white or black key, and the shaded circle at the end would be the 13th note that begins the next octave. The black circle on this illustration represents the third dimension, our known universe, and the fourth circle, the fourth dimension. The 12 major overtones between any two notes or dimensions are a replica of a larger patterns, phantoms, and duplicates. It's holographic. Holographic Universe. Man, shout out to Ty Battle, man. She dropped the PDF of Holographic Universe. Go in the drop library. Passwords 1234 to get through the dogs. Go. If you carry it further between each overtone, you find another 12 overtones that replicate the whole pattern. It goes down and up literally forever. This is called a geometric progression only in harmonics. If you continue to study it, you'll find that each of the unique musical scales that have been Discover, produce a different octave of experience. More universes to explore. You've probably heard people talk about the 144 dimensions, right? 144. And how the number 144 relates to the spiritual subjects. This is because there are 12 notes in an octave and 12 overtones between each note. 12 by 12, 144. You still in the nine. Three times three, right? Twelve. One plus two is three. One plus two is three. Three times three is nine. One, four, four, nine. Numbers were discovered, not invented. To be specific, there are 12 major dimensions and 132 minor dimensions within each octave. Though in truth, the progression goes on forever. The diagram represents one octave. 
the 13th note repeats then there's another octave above that one there's an octave of universes below this and an octave above and it stretches on theoretically forever so as big and as infinite as this universe seems which is just an illusion anyway there are still an infinite number of other ways to express the one reality and each dimension is experimentally completely different from another let's go so what are we getting the arm right they set the 7.23. Let's get it back. And remember, man, this is when they created their very powerful field. They amped it up over 50,000 times over. So that the 7.23 centimeter wavelength coming from everywhere, boss, would not interfere, boss. Let's go. So what are they talking about, man? 7.23 and it would be the true sound of ohm for this dimension 7.23 centimeter wavelength is the ohm well what's the ohm <laughs> pull it up man it's a link from mindbodygreen.com ohm is a mantra or vibration that is traditionally chanted at the beginning and end of yoga so this is a mantra this is a vibration this is 7.23 this is ohm this is the same frequency that they're calling what background noise static annoyance this annoyance was a uniform signal but they don't know where it came from but it's just cosmic background radiation to the hijack it's called cosmic background uh, microwave radiation or static right or just noise we're just saying 7.23 centimeter wavelength which is all but to the real one it's a vibration that is traditionally chanted at the beginning and the end of yoga sessions or just you know what I'm saying in the flow coming from Hinduism or Hindu, Hinduism and yoga. Remember, they split you apart. They're, they're, they're practicing you. You know what I mean? Everyone got a piece of you. Let's go. The mantra is considered to have high spiritual and creative creation, creative power. But despite this, it is a mantra that can be recited by anyone. It's both a sound and a symbol, a sound and a symbol, rich in meaning and depth. And when pronounced correctly, it is actually um actually consists of four syllables, A-U-M, and the silent syllable. The first syllable, A, pronounced as a prolonged all. Oh. The sound starts at the back of your throat and you stretch it out. You will start feeling your solar plexus and chest vibrating. The second syllable, um, pronounced as a prolonged oo, with the sound gradually rolling forward along your upper palate, you'll feel your throat vibrate. The third syllable, Mm. Pronounced as a prolonged mm. with your front teeth gently touching, you will now start to feel the top, feel the top of your vibrate. <laughs> the last syllable is the deep silence of the infinite. As intelligence rises from the deep silence, you have. To merge your chant from the M mm to the deep silence. Silence. Deep silence. Symbolically, the three letters embody the divine Shakti and its three main characters creation. Alright, so we're just going back to creation. What they're calling static and background noise. We're, we're learning the drop that we're referring to creation, preservation, and liberation. 
Why do we chant it? Let's go. Everything in the universe is pulsating and vibrating. Nothing really standing still. The sound Aum, when chanted, vibrates at the frequency of 432 hertz. So when we talk 7.23 and the static and the noise, it is 432, the 9, 7.23 is the 3, right? The 7, 2, 9, 3, 3, 6, 9, 4, 3, 2, 9. The sound, om, when chanted, vibrates. At the frequency of 432 hertz. So when you're doing it right, you're pitch perfect in the frequency of what? Creation. Preservation. Liberation. When we playing music, hip-hop, whatever, man. We might be playing Tupac. But whatever you hear, it's going to be in the frequency of creation. Preservation. Liberation. Your ear has a cochlea. The cochlea in your ear is a spiral. The spiral is represented by the number nine. Nine is not just a number. It is a portal, a dimension, a spiral, a doorway. Then we can open up a doorway, a path to receive the understanding, overstanding, understanding that we need to receive the life, the light. That was been shut off. Now it can be liberated. Why do we chant? Why are we in this, in this frequency that they're calling static? Because it vibrates at the frequency of 432 hertz. The nine, the, the spiral, the portal. You could be in the loop going around and around forever. Or you can spiral up out the loop. Or you can spiral down. Spiral up, spiral down. Let's go. So, again, the sound om um, when chanted vibrates at the frequency of 432 hertz, which is the same vibrational frequency found throughout everything in nature. Now, we played the wordplay before, so we know what we're talking about when we talk nature. You know, well, you know we're talking about the Amaru Khan which is natural, we're talking about the copper colored races, but they say a native of America, and then we say what is a native, and they say in 1828, produced by nature. You see how this is all connected with you? The copper color and Marikan has everything to do with nature, has everything to do with 432. 432 is nature, which is the native. But what do they say nature is in 1828? Noah Webster Dictionary. In a general sense, whatever is made or produced, a word that comprehends all the works of God. Oh, right. So you say by the expression, trees and fossils are produced by nature, we mean... They are formed or produced by certain inherent powers in matter. Or we mean that they are produced by God, uh, the creator, the author of whatever is made or produced. So when we keep hearing nature, we are referring directly to produced by Hawa, produced by the creator. The creator is nature is the native native produced by nature produced by hawa produced by your creator who the america a native of america that means that you are he or she that is produced by the creator here from born connected originally copper color races Found here by the Europeans are the people of the Creator, produced by the Creator, right here in the Promised Land. What does it have to do with nature? 
What does the American have to do, the native have to do with nature? Oh, man. We just talking nature. Vibrates at a frequency of 432 hertz. Which is the same vibrational frequency found throughout everything in nature. Produced by Hawa. As such, Ahu is the base sound of the universe. So by chanting it, we are symbolically and physically tuning into this sound and acknowledging our connection to all other living beings. The creator, nature, nature, the creator, let's go. You got to keep letting know because this is 1828. So this is, you know, them giving us the real spill of what they mean when they speak it in codes. Produced by the creator. Got you. Everything produced by the creator is in this frequency, which is why we stay in it. In addition, the vibrations and rhythmic pr pronunciation also have a physical effect on the body by slowing down the nervous system. All right, cool. Well, we're just talking the um four three two, the um the same vibration and frequency found throughout everything produced by the creator. <coughs> Let's go. We're just talking seven point two three. This is a joint call from Gold Gold's Tube. Alright. Gold's tube. We got a little uh, binary sound. You know what I mean? Check it out. Now look, man. The binary sound of 7.23 wavelength. We already know the connection between 7.23 and 432 hertz. We know that the arm in itself, the 7.23 wavelength is the arm. The arm vibrates at 432. So 7.23 by default. Is connected to what? 432. But in case you need the math, let's go. So the frequency in air at two temperatures, freezing point of water, boiling point, velocity of sound, air varies for different temperatures. So it's going to all the drop. But let's get the drop right here. So water boiling point frequency 3.87.22 equals 3.5. 5.5, five. all right, this divided by 216 equals 21.218, all right, which is heard as the beating frequency in this sound. 2.16 is half of 432, and there are some thoughts that 216 is the ratio of our solar system connected with the cosmos as an alternative to 432. The sound of arm for 8 minutes, 20 seconds, the average time it takes light to travel from the sun to earth. The 7.23 line sound session provided is not meant to replace or substitute the recommendation. Alright man, so it's, <laughs> check on this binary code. You know, we get a couple minutes of this. 7.23. Let's, let's go back. Seven point two three frequency with two sixteen ratio frequency of sound and air. All right. Let's check it out for a second. So they're literally, it says frequency at two temperatures with 432 ratio. And I believe they're going to use this to boil water, you know what I mean? So skip ahead a little bit. <laughs> Plus 
platonic solids, man. Urban Reed got the job. It's all platonic solids, man. I know it's kind of high pitch for you, man, but you know what I mean? You get the job. Let's get this right here. Actually, I want to dismount. And the major third. All right, let's start with this one. I'm going to dismount with that last one there, man. So. This link right here, man, from lifeharmonizer.name. Chanting the own. When you feel depressed, chant own. Own. Many times. And feel its powerful tonic. Because it is an infinite sound. You got to look up infinite. Huh? The sound of creation. God. You read it. You dig on it, man. Let's go. So the OM, right? The OM. The, the 432. The 7.23. Because it is the infinite sound of creation. Hawa. That can be heard in the tiny place in the sacred space in your heart. Remember, your heart is the first organ to start forming in the womb, in the heart bone. See, the hijack can hijack your mind, but they can't have your heart, man. Don't give them your heart. Don't give them your frequency. Now, again. These jokers over here calling this noise background noise, static, annoyance. But all they really are referencing is your heart. Your sacred space of your heart is where you can hear the sound. So when we say we hear the same sound, it is not play play. Drop is not just saying some fancy words, man. I'm saying we are listening to the same sound. The design of 432 Drive is the design of Hawaii because it wasn't my plan at all, man. I had a whole nother life plan. The Most High humbled me to a point where I couldn't see no other direction but this direction. And a lot of us, you know, have similar paths. So to be where we're at right now, the Most High has given us a path, a sound to hear. Now the world's waking up to 432. Before they were whispering about it, now they're comfortable with it. And we talked the nine, the nine Templar, the dragon nine. Now they're getting cozy with the overstanding of the fire, the water, the ether, the land, the dragon to see clearly. But you can't see clearly if you can't hear the sound. What does sight have to do with sound? Oh, man. So this is an infinite sound of creation and a wah that can be heard in the tiny place in the sacred space of your heart, the chanting of Aum. With A equals 432, Hertz drives away all worldly thoughts and removes distraction. So we're trying to stay focused. You know what I'm saying? We're trying to be hijacked free. And what's allowed us to see clearly, you know, and in a major part is staying in this frequency while we read the books. You know, you come over to the radio, we're not just reading all these books to you, man. You know what I'm saying? You got over thirty radio shows and we're not just doing just reading the books, you know, from we're in four three two. We got music flowing, all that's tuned to four three two. And why? So it can remove your worldly thoughts and remove the distraction so you can get the light, so you can get the drop, the healing do, hijack free in a secluded alcove, man. Those who chant home regularly absorb more life force. What's the Star Wars? Let's go. Life force energy and develop a stronger, sweeter voice. Those who meditate daily on the OM develop more lustrous eyes. What does sound have to do with sight, we ask? With the sound comes 
sight and few new and feel new vigor and strength so you got strengthened from the sound all um, right four three two symbol of a sacred syllable representing Brahman the impersonal uh, absolute omnipotent omnipresent and the source of all manif all manifest existence the difference in spelling om or om is merely a matter of transliteration in Buddhism the om symbolizes the ultimate reality and the entire universe though its sound and through its sound and form creation preservation M stands for destruction or dissolution. They also said liberation before. The three portions of Aum relate to the states of, of waking, dream, and deep sleep. The three letters also indicate three planes of existence, right? Those threes again. Three planes, heaven, earth, and the nether world. The Aum sound, A equals 432, can be considered the sound of one's own heart. And nervous system. The 432 is your heart bone, your nervous system that connects it all. The mem meditators, meditators and mystics hear it daily, like the sound made by an electrical transformer or a swarm of bees. So those that are meditating or are focused, they can hear this sound. The same sound that's being called the annoyance or the cosmic microwave radiation. The background noise, they said, is coming from everywhere, boss. Everywhere, boss. The background noise. We're hearing it like static in the radio. It's coming from everywhere. We don't know. <laughs> we don't know where, where it's coming from. Maybe it's just some sound coming from the Big Bang. Man, maybe it's the Big Bang leaving this, uh, what they say. This residue, the residue of the explosion, man. Is it the residue? You decide. I mean, I'm just presenting information. I, I'm i excited to hear and see, you know what I mean, um, a lot more attention on this. You know what I'm saying? We're not trying to patent <laughs> no frequency. We're trying to spread the frequency. So when we see it spread and we see people talking about it, then we know that we, we put in the right, you know what I'm saying, uh, the right energy, man, for the right time, you know what I mean, and it's kind of like the Matrix said, you know what I mean, they're your enemy until they're unplugged, when, once you have unplugged, you know what I'm saying, at least from the ignorance of not asking about your frequency, when you hear a song, you say, I like this song, but what frequency is it in, everybody doing the kiki in my feelings challenge, but did anybody doing a 432, or they just you know what I'm saying, not hearing the sound, you know, not 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 feeling the drop. We're just caught up in the matrix, right? The residue of the explosion. Yeah. But those that are meditating and focused, man, they can hear the sound. It says they hear it all the time. The sound of one's own heart. But it returns as the minds become perfect.